The Broadcom CEO, Hawk Tan, has been in the semiconductor industry for decades, but he's really actually kind of a finance guy. Uh, much of his early career took place in the uh, investment management world. So in case it maybe not Jack Donaghy in 30 Rock, maybe more like Jack Donaghy's boss, Don Geis, played by the actor Rip Torn. Welcome back everyone to Chip Stock Investor. Before we get into our subject today, we want to just say thank you so much for subscribing to our channel and watching our videos. We are extremely close to hitting our 10,000 sub goal by the end of this year. Looks like we might come in a month before our goal is met. So thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we really do. We started this channel as some of you may know, just over a year ago. So to hit 10,000 subscribers this quick, yeah, we're excited that you're all here. Thank you so much. And our promise to you in 2024, we still consider ourselves a very small startup channel. We will continue trying to improve our content so that it is, is as valuable to you as we can possibly make it. So thank you again. Looking forward to hopefully another great year in 2024. Let's talk about Broadcom, Casey. November 22nd of this year, Broadcom finally closed on its record-breaking acquisition of VMware, which when was originally announced in May of 2022, was worth $61 billion. Upon close, VMware was valued at nearly $70 billion. Half was paid in cash, which Broadcom funded with debt, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and the other half was in new Broadcom stock. For a little context on the biggest software deals ever, I'm just going to rattle off a few here. Dell acquired EMC for $67 billion in 2016. IBM bought Red Hat for $34 billion in 2019. Cisco Splunk deal was valued at $28 billion. And Salesforce, when they added Slack, it was 28 billion in 2021. So you can see this was a very big acquisition for Broadcom, one of the biggest, in fact. Nick, last week we talked about the enterprise to free cash flow value of Broadcom when it was acquiring VMware. Can you explain a little bit more about that metric? Right, Casey, enterprise value we think is a very important metric, especially when you're considering a company like Broadcom that has significant debt. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but in our last video that we did on NVIDIA, at the end, we did talk about that enterprise value for Broadcom plus VMware. If you're not aware, enterprise value is a company's market cap, market capitalization, plus debt, minus cash and short-term investments. That's typically how you would calculate enterprise value. This is typically the value that is used when a company is being acquired. So obviously, of course, in this case, it's VMware. Currently, the enterprise value as of this recording on November 27th, after market close, the two companies combined have an enterprise value of about $500 billion. Roughly $430 billion of that is Broadcom, and then in case you said just shy of 70 billion was VMware when it was acquired. So combined now today, let's just round it to 500 billion total enterprise value for Broadcom plus VMware, making it obviously one of the largest tech stocks in the world and the second largest semiconductor stock, second to NVIDIA's enterprise value of, of about 1.2, 1.1, 1 1.2 trillion. Before continuing, let me remind you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if this video is helpful as you do your own investment research and increase your knowledge of business and technology. We really appreciate the support as subscribing to the channel helps us continue putting out content like this. Nick, what about that enterprise value to free cash flow metric that we talked about last week? How does that affect the valuation of Broadcom now that it's acquired VMware? Right. So again, Casey, we often talk about the free cash flow valuations based on free cash flow. So instead of using market cap, usually you would do market cap divided by trailing 12 month free cash flow. All we're doing here is taking the enterprise value divided by trailing 12 month free cash flow. 
So on a pro forma basis, that's combining Broadcom plus VMware as if they were the same business over the course of the last year, the EV enterprise value to free cash flow. So EV to FCF valuation on this stock currently sits at about a 23x multiple. Uh, so long story short for, for this video, Casey, before we delve into some more of the details, we don't think this is a value anymore. When we launched this channel over a year ago, Broadcom was one of our top buys. The stock has done incredibly well over the course of the last year and couple of months. And we're still very happy to have it as part of our portfolio, but we are removing it from our top buys now list at this point, given that elevated 23x EV to free cash flow metric. That's the short story. Maybe we should delve into the details now. Let's discuss Broadcom and VMware and its role as a very unique investment option. And now we'll talk about some numbers here that are on a pro forma basis. So it'll be over the last trailing 12 months as if Broadcom and VMware were one company over the last year. So the two combined companies reported 57% of their revenue was chip sales. As we've talked about many times, the new infrastructure of this digital era is semiconductors. And around 43% of their revenue was software, this so-called infinitely scalable business model. Broadcom generated $7.5 billion in trailing 12-month infrastructure software sales, plus $13.6 billion from VMware, which is a total of $21.1 billion in software. Semiconductor sales from Broadcom over the last trailing 12 months was nearly 28 billion, 27.9 billion. So since we're talking about the VMware acquisition, let's start with the infrastructure software part of the business, Casey. We have some KPIs, some key performance indicators provided from our friends at Main Street data that help illustrate this. First, let's look at VMware's revenue by segment. You can see the company's software and service breakdown here in the chart. And by far the biggest product here in, in, in this breakdown is the hypervisor, which uh, we've covered in past videos showing you a visualization here. But in basic terms, what this is, is it's a software-based product that virtualizes a server or, or a powerful computer housed inside of a data center so that each of those powerful computers, those servers, can allocate a bit of compute to each customer that's sharing the usage of that server. So again, just to repeat, think of the server, this powerful computer and a data center, but the whole idea of the cloud is that you're able to rent just a small bit of compute that you need as a small business and not have to purchase the whole server yourself. So the hypervisor is a critical component that is able to split up the compute power of that server and provision it for each customer that is renting a small piece of, of compute power. That's really interesting, Nick. So why is Broadcom so interested in this piece of software, this hypervisor? Right. So at the time, Broadcom started acquiring infrastructure software a number of years ago. It seemed like these things were completely unrelated. But as we'll show you here in a moment, uh, Broadcom sells a lot of networking chips that go into the data center. Networking being the management of all the information that flows within and into and out of a data center. Think of it as the manager of a very, very busy piece of traffic uh, vehicular infrastructure. So let's take a look at Broadcom's press release here and specifically where they will be investing in VMware to complement the chips that they already design and sell to data center operators, uh, cloud service providers, and the like. So they mention in the press release announcing the closing of, of the merger with VMware, this investment in VMware Cloud Foundation, and they're going to be investing in further modernization and optimization of cloud and edge environments. Those are smaller data centers located close to the end user. And some of the products that they are interested in investing in include VMware Tanzu, which helps with the deployment of cloud-based applications, as well as application networking and load balancing, 
So again, just management of data traffic and advanced security services. This VMware Cloud Foundation is very important because it's computing infrastructure for public cloud, like AWS, Azure, all those data centers that are involved with that, as well as private cloud, company-owned and operated data centers, enterprises, and things like that. Broadcom's investment in this will also no doubt include that private AI foundation that VMware announced with NVIDIA earlier this year, which will help customers build infrastructure to help manage their private data used in generative and other AI training. As for Broadcom's existing $7.5 billion infrastructure software revenue over the last trailing 12 months, it acquired the enterprise portion of Symantec in 2019, which was for cybersecurity, CA Technologies in 2018, which provided enterprise software specifically for IBM mainframe computers, and Brocade Communication Systems in 2017, which was for data networking, storage chips, and software. So Casey, you mentioned the history of some of these software acquisitions. Let's rewind a little bit because in particular when, not so much when Brocade was acquired, but specifically the big CA technologies in 2018, this was a real head scratcher for a a lot of people. Broadcom CEO Hawk Tan has been in the semiconductor industry for decades, but he's really actually kind of a finance guy. Uh, much of his early career took place in the uh, investment management world. And that really shows up in the way Broadcom is operated. This company largely operates as a type of investment conglomerate. The chip business in particular, because it sounds like VMware will now be the overarching parent for these software acquisitions, but the chip business, which we'll now talk about behind the scenes is actually organized into various, I think it's maybe up to nine or 10 individual chip segments. Each of them has a a type of unit lieutenant. As you mentioned this, as we were prepping Casey, like a type of CEO for each of these semiconductor businesses that have a great deal of autonomy to manage their business manage the uh, intellectual property of that business. Of course, sales and IP can be bundled together and combined as needed, but those individual chip segments, it kind of sounds like, you know, this is a compartmentalized business that these different units are kept in competition with each other. And the goal is to drive profit margins higher. Take a look at these operating profit margins for Broadcom, very, very high, typically in the mid to high 30% range sometimes higher, and then free cash flow profit margin surpassed the 50% margin mark in recent quarters. That is absolutely incredible. And if if you didn't think Broadcom was a type of investment conglomerate before, I think these numbers alone kind of prove that this is Hawk Tan's overarching management style. Keep these different units in competition with each other and drive higher profit margins. There's this relentless search to not just grow the business, but continue to grow the business at an ever more profitable rate. Quick break from chip stock investor Casey, and I wanted to talk to you about Main Street Data. Main Street Data is a data visualization and charting platform that helps investors analyze companies in the stock market. Because the stock market is so complex, it can be very difficult to make informed investment decisions without the right tools. Main Street Data gives you the tools and information you need to make better investment decisions. Main Street Data offers a variety of benefits, including data visualization, charting tools, and company earnings, calls, transcripts, which are an easy way to reference up-to-date comments from management of your favorite stocks. You can sign up for Main Street Data today and get a special discount through our link below in the description. Here's how Broadcom organized its financial segments by product as of Q3 fiscal 2023, and that was the month ending in July. We'll circle back to Q4, which we will find out more about on December 7th. But take a look at the sales segments here. Networking up 20% year over year. Wireless was flat storage connectivity, also flat year over year, broadband, just 1%, 
industrial down 3%, infrastructure software at 5% growth. So as you can see from this chart, networking was basically the only thing that actually had some significant growth. Nick, why is that? AI, sorry to use the buzzword folks, but the AI chip business, which includes two major product releases geared specifically to generative AI. There's the Tomahawk 5 switch chip. So a switch chip connects clusters of GPUs. And of course, those are primarily these days NVIDIA GPUs used for generative AI training. So the Tomahawk 5 and the Jericho 3 AI router and router hardware helps coordinate the overall flow of traffic within a data center and even into and out of a data center as well. So those two products were the major growth drivers of the networking segment, excluding AI networking business. Broadcom had said that its semiconductor business overall was flat year over year in Q3 fiscal 2023. We'll see how things fare in Q4. Again, as you can see from this chart, Broadcom was again expecting 20% plus growth year over year in Q4. But you, you can see much of, of the rest of the chip segments expected to be down on a year over year basis. Wireless storage connectivity and broadband with the sole exception being the industrial segment. But that's a very, very tiny segment and it's only expected to be up a low single digit percentage. Much of this jives with what we've been hearing from other chip companies as we suddenly have, it looks like a bit of an excess of chip inventory for things like automotive and some communications and some industrial chips. We'll see again what happens in Q4, but networking, the lone growth driver here, thanks to AI chips. Again, like Casey said, we'll circle back to this in a couple of weeks after Broadcom reports its Q4 results on December 7th. Last year in 2022, we can easily say that Broadcom stock was very, very cheap. And even into early this year, 2023, but that value trade is definitely gone. But at 23 times trailing 12 month free cash flow, that's Broadcom and VMware, this is by no means a ludicrously expensive stock. We're still on hold though after the big run up and we do expect a down cycle. Software should be relatively flat up to mid single digit percentages, but chip sales could decline. And here's some of the products that we're talking about when we say chip sales. Yeah, just to emphasize this point here, yes, generative AI chips are growing like crazy right now, but some of these segments that you point out here, Casey, in this chart, broadband and communications chips in a cyclical decline at the moment, data center, excluding AI, as well as enterprise chips being more traditional computers, like you mentioned earlier, Casey, like those IBM mainframes, a big, powerful computer that's maybe housed in an office building somewhere that takes care of all the compute needs for that physical location. And Perhaps also to to a certain extent, we'll see how Apple does with some of its new iPhone sales and perhaps maybe a bit of a rebound in its PC sales driven by those new MacBook releases. But at least in, in the last quarter, Broadcom was expecting some declines in its wireless business as well as it helps companies like Apple sort of manage through some of uh, the last bit of excess inventory before an expected rebound in smartphone and PC uh, growth headed into calendar year 2024. So a big key to this acquisition actually making sense will be with CEO Hawk Tan driving operating margin expansion at VMware, like he has with his numerous other acquisitions over the years. VMware has a lot of work to do with free cash flow margins of only about 35% in the last year. So Nick, why is this such a big deal? Yeah, only... In, in air quotes, right? 35% free cash flow margins are quite good, but it, it appears Broadcom is making this a top priority. It looks like there was already some announced layoffs here in the first week after VMware getting acquired. And it, it's important, like you say, Casey, because remember Broadcom is taking out significant amounts of debt to make this deal happen. 
Broadcom already had 39 billion in debt on its balance sheet. Of course, offset by 12.1 billion in cash and short-term investments at the end of July, but 39 billion in debt already. It's taking on about 28 billion more for the purchase of VMware, plus assuming about $4 billion of net debt on VMware's balance sheet. That's debt over and above cash and short-term investments that VMware had at its last report. So an additional $4 billion in debt from VMware. So in total, about $30, $32 billion in net debt will get added to Broadcom's balance sheet. That's going to bring its grand total to about $70 billion. Again, we won't know the exact number until Broadcom provides some quarterly financial updates. That's probably not going to happen until early next year because the VMware deal didn't close until November, which is after Broadcom's Q4 fiscal 2023 that it'll report on December 7th. But nevertheless, I think you can see the importance of increasing those free cash flow margins at VMware. Uh, Broadcom is going to need to pay off some debt over the next couple of years. Absolutely critical here for this being a success. And what you just said, Nick, is really the primary reason we're calling out this enterprise value to free cash flow valuation metric. For a company with this much debt, we think a multiple of 23 times EV to free cash flow is a bit high, especially if growth is minimal over at least the next couple of quarters. That's right. That said, Casey, we are still happy long-term shareholders. We've owned Broadcom for many years. We have no plans on selling at this point, but we are on pause with even considering making any additional purchases. This is no longer on our best buy semiconductor list, but we are interested in seeing what happens. Again, like you said, the next few quarters, we could see overall semiconductor sales flatline as there is a bit of a cyclical downturn in some areas of the chip market now, especially industrial and communications and enterprise compute chips. But we'll be interested to see how Broadcom is able to manage this because this is an absolute computing infrastructure juggernaut. Like you said, Casey, it's a very unique investment at this point spanning chips to apps. There's really nothing quite like Broadcom out there at this point. 57% 57% chips, chip sales, 43% software. It, it, it's unique. The only thing that concerns me going forward, Casey, is I really hope this is not a repeat of the old peak General Electric, peak GE of the late 90s and early 2000s under Jack Welch or Neutron Jack. That's a different topic. If you aren't sure what I'm talking about, we'll point you in the direction of this NPR piece that provides a general overview of peak General Electric and what went wrong at that company under a longtime CEO, Jack Welch. At any rate, way too soon to call Broadcom the new General Electric of the 2020s. But that's my concern. As I look over this thing and this hot streak of acquisitions Broadcom has made over the last five, six years in particular, is debt getting a little bit too unwieldy? Are, are they reaching too far? Let's see how they manage the debt. I have to go back for just a second to Neutron Jack. Is this who Jack Donaghy was modeled after in 30 Rock? So Casey, maybe not Jack Donaghy in 30 Rock, maybe more like Jack Donaghy's boss, Don Geis, played by the actor Rip Torn. Anyways, that's maybe, if you don't want to read the an overview of Jack Welch, maybe watch some old 30 Rock episodes instead. Anyways, Casey, close us out here. (laughs) Watching 30 Rock is definitely more entertaining than this NPR piece, but still a good piece. Not taking anything away from that. Thanks for watching today, our episode on Broadcom. Thanks again for being our viewers. We appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button. We have a lot of great things coming your way and some new projects that we've been working on. We're still working on our website. It's ready for you to take a peek at, but we're not finished with it yet. So check us out at chipstockinvestor.com. And this week we will have that episode on Palo Alto Networks that we promised you and the digital payment systems. 
We have CrowdStrike reporting this week as well, so we will tie that in to our videos. Yeah, and maybe just one more little sneak peek. So many of you have gotten used to seeing Casey's semiconductor industry flowchart quite often. We are going to circle back to that real soon and provide a, a more in-depth overview once again on what that is and how you can use it in trying to figure out how companies in the semiconductor space actually make money. See you all again soon at Chipstock Investor.